in animated filmmaking, a lot goes behind the scenes that you will never see in the final frame. The tools used aren't always obvious, but they shape everything. How characters move, how environments react, and how the scene feels. And among those tools, Maya ended up becoming something like a pillar that holds the entire process. But this didn't happen by accident. Maya didn't appear and took over. It actually grew into that role because of how it was built, how it fits studio workflows, and how the industry shaped itself around it. So let's unpack how Maya became the backbone of animation projects and why so many animation studios are still using it as one of their main 3D software. To understand Maya's current place in the industry, it helps to look at where it came from. Maya wasn't built from scratch. It was a result of merging two different technologies, Alias and Wavefront, that came from very different corners of the 3D world. Alias focused on industrial modeling. Their software Alias Studio was built for creating smooth, precise surfaces, which are perfect for automotive design. Companies like Honda and GM used it to develop concept cars long before they hit production. On the other hand, Wavefront was more about entertainment. Their software handled animation and rendering for films like The Abyss and Terminator 2. So one side brought technical precision and the other brought cinematic effects. In 1995, they merged and created Maya, released in 1998, with the goal of handling every step of 3D production in one place. This meant modeling, rigging, animation, and rendering all inside one tool. And right from the start, Maya leaned heavily into a node-based system. Every part of a scene, a light, a texture, a movement, was a node you could plug into other nodes, disconnect and adjust freely. The structure gave artists room to experiment without blowing up the rest of their work. Maya was already gaining traction by the early 2000s, but things really shifted in 2006 when Autodesk bought Alias Wavefront. Autodesk already had 3ds Max, which was widely used for games and visualization. By acquiring Maya, they owned both major players, Max for game assets and environments, and Maya for characters and animation. Instead of folding them together, Autodesk carved out space for both. Maya stayed focused on film and animation while Max kept its grip on the game development world. Then Autodesk started connecting Maya to the rest of its ecosystem, Motion Builder for mocap and Mudbox for sculpting, and later Arnold for rendering. This kind of integration made pipelines easier to manage. Studios didn't need to stitch together third-party software to handle each step. Maya became the anchor in the system of tools that just worked together, which is exactly what big production needed. Just on a side note, studios actually still needed third-party plugins, but this new system made it a lot easier. And then there is education. Autodesk made Maya free for students and schools, which had a long-term effect. Schools started because studios used it, and studios used it because new artists already knew how to use it. This cycle actually helps keep Maya alive in animation studios and VFX productions around the world. Maya didn't win by default, it had competition, and it still does. Back when Maya entered the scene, tools like Softimage and Lightwave 3D were widely used. Lightwave was behind some of the most iconic TV and film projects in the 90s and the early 2000s, like Babylon 5, Titanic, Iron Man, and it had a solid feature set. But over time, it lagged behind in development and couldn't keep up with evolving standard needs. Softimage was another strong option, especially for rigging and animation. But after Autodesk acquired it too, it was eventually discontinued, leaving Maya to fill that gap. Then there is Houdini, technically incredible, especially for simulation and procedural workflows. But Houdini has a steep learning curve, and it isn't always the first choice, especially for character animation. It's more common to see Houdini used alongside Maya rather than working against it. 
and of course Blender, which has grown massively in the last decade, and for a good reason too. It is free, open source, and packed with features. It's gaining traction among independent creators, and even some studios. But there is still hesitation when it comes to large-scale animated film productions. A big part of that is technical support. Blender doesn't offer that kind of studio-focused support that companies like Autodesk offer, and this actually makes it harder for big productions to fully commit to it. So while other tools have strengths, and they are absolutely popular in the industry, Maya became a tool studio shaped their pipelines around, even though it wasn't the only option. It was the one that fit their needs and they are the most happy with. In animated film productions, nothing is more central than character performance. That means rigging and animation have to be rock solid. Maya's rigging tools support full body systems, in addition to facial controls and layered deformation setups that animators can use without breaking anything down the road. Studios also build custom tools on top of Maya using male scripting language or Python. These scripts automate everything from facial control sliders to massive crowd behavior systems. For example, what a digital used Maya to manage thousands of characters in Avatar, and those characters moved independently but responded to the world around them, and all of these characters were built and animated inside Maya. Disney's Frozen is another example. Elsa's ice magic wasn't just a post-processing effect. The trails and ice structures were driven by simulations that had to follow her hand gestures frame by frame. Maya structures actually made that possible, and animators could update the effect, sync it with the performance, and preview it without bouncing between multiple tools. Studios like Pixar and DreamWorks are often seen as exceptions because they use proprietary software like Presto and Primo, respectively. But even in those studios, Maya plays a huge role. At Pixar, Maya handles modeling and rigging. Characters are built and prepared in Maya before being animated in Presto, and DreamWorks does something similar. Primo handles the animation, while the assets come through Maya first. Rigging, skinning, and even environment setup are done in Maya, because those tools are already well established and reliable. This works because Maya is strong in technical preparation, and proprietary tools are built to handle playback and shot editing, but they still depend on a stable structure, I mean underneath, and Maya provides that. Autodesk integration of Arnold made rendering even more direct. It is now built into Maya and gives artists accurate light simulation right in the viewport. In projects like The Lion King in 2019, Arnold handled foreshading and even environment lighting directly inside Maya. Artists were able to use it and see results immediately and make changes without re-exporting everything. Simulations are handled in Maya too. Bifrost allows for fluid, smoke, and fire simulations. X-Gen handles hair and for grooming. For animated films that need both stylization and realistic details, keeping these systems together in one environment saves time and helps avoid compatibility problems. As mentioned earlier, many artists and studios still turn to software such as Houdini for more advanced or large-scale realistic simulations, especially when working with destruction, crowds, or procedural effects. It is common to see Maya and Houdini used side by side, with each tool focusing on the part that it can handle best. Nowadays Maya is actually irreplaceable, not because it's brand loyalty. In fact, it is because pipelines, the actual infrastructure behind the film productions, are built around it, custom tools, file structures, team workflows, and even asset libraries. All of these are built around Maya, and replacing it means rewriting tools, retraining artists, and rebuilding years of studio infrastructure. This is not just expensive, it is risky. 
For animated films that take years to produce, switching software halfway through is rarely worth the trade-off. Even when tools come along, most studios prefer to keep Maya where it is and iterate other tools around it. Houdini might handle effects, Blender can be used for pre-visualization and concept art too, but Maya stays in place because it is often the center of animation productions. And there you have it guys. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. You can also check some of our previous videos. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.